oftentimes, you know, um, depends of how the practice are set up in the country, these patients come to two different groups. You know, uh, for some of us, they come directly through urology, but they get shuffled quite quickly into Medong. But I would argue that uh, urologists in, in America are capturing the bulk of these patients at the front. Have you, from the urological perspective, see a big uptake into the new oral therapy, uh, even with docetaxel base? Um, we have. I think, I think one of the things that's compelling, like Neil said, is there has been an uptick uh, in these patients that we've seen, unfortunately. I think the thing that, that I think is also crucial to talk about is monotherapy, ADT monotherapy is not the right answer. We all live this on a daily basis, but I will tell you, being both in a big group and, and talking to people around the country, some people still think that that's potentially the right answer. So I think we're going to talk about the nitty gritty of all these different subtleties of, of good therapy and what good looks like, but I think it's important to just get out there that monotherapy is not necessarily the right answer. Um, and you mean monotherapy with uh, ADT, uh, just hormonal ADT therapy, ADT yeah. Therapy. Because I think that's still. I mean, we see it that people get referred to us as the advanced prostate cancer guy, and they've been on ADT monotherapy for a while, and they've never been talked to about some of these advanced agents, whether it's 6 docetaxel or, you know, the new oral oncolytics. Yeah, so I, I've recently seen some marketing data, and um, about 70% of patients in the United States are still getting ADT monotherapy, and it's not too dissimilar around the rest of the world. And this is today. Right. And so I think that's unacceptable with the existing data as it currently stands. But I think that's the importance of something yeah. like this to fully, say. Fully agree, but it's quite amazing. Well, why does that happen? You give the ADT, you see the PSA come down, yeah. you declare victory. Well, that's unacceptable because there's now all the level one evidence which you're going to review. Uh, but I guess one of the, I was at a, a, a conference recently and someone said, well, but if I have somebody with high volume disease and they're asymptomatic and I start them on ADT, and their PSA goes less than one or almost to zero. Why, why, can't, why do I have to start combination therapy? And I said, well, because there's level one evidence. But uh, so, so, you know, I actually, that's, that's actually right on the money. You know, oftentimes when I get those calls or even when I see patients, you know, I actually tell my patients, you know, I think the state uh, or the management of advanced disease has really changed. And I use December 2013 as the benchmark for us because it is in that month, in that year, that we released the results of the charted data, the ECOG data, that to me really changed the standard practice throughout the United States at least. It is six months later, right, when uh, Chris Sweeney, James Nicola presented a stampede and the charted data, at least for chemotherapy. But since then, we have charted stampede for chemotherapy. Then 2017, we have latitude, which is high volume disease using uh, the biosynthesis inhibitor abirinone acetate. And on top of that, we have the arm within a stampede looking at the same biosynthesis inhibitor. And then last year, or this year, we have now new data looking at not only apalutamide as a new air inhibitor, but also we have with looking at, obviously, at the Titan data, but also we have Ensamed, and now also Arches looking at Ensalutamide in the same space. So when you think of five, six different trials with roughly three different, four different agents, right, how do you guys make that decision as to how do I pick? And I agree with you. I think high and low volume meant a lot more before ESMO 2019. But I still think volume matters for us when we're distinguishing these agents to some extent, especially when you're thinking about local control for those patients that have local tumors in place. But how do you guys, Alicia, how do you, guys, how do you make that decision between do I get chemo or do I get an oral agent? And if you pick an oral agent, which out of the agents would you pick and why? So again, if it's low volume, I'm going to talk to the patient about radiation to the primary. So I just don't want to forget that. As a medical oncologist, sometimes I, I do because I focus so much on systemic therapy. Uh, but when I am thinking about high, low volume, particularly if there's visceral disease, I think there's a convention sometimes that we think about chemotherapy. I also have a really in-depth conversation with my patients, trying not to overwhelm them and splitting people into chemo and AR-directed therapies, um, because or, or, or having that conversation around chemo versus AR-directed, and I don't go into all the nitty-gritty of every AR-directed therapy until we've at least made that decision. Chemo is over relatively quickly if they're fit enough to tolerate it um, and does not have the copay issues that, that 
patients can face when they're using the AR-directed uh, therapies. And some patients do like to kind of get that chemo out of the way and continue on their injections, which is most commonly what they do for an extended period of time before they need to initiate something else, particularly because some people feel like they may be fit for it now, but they may not be fit for chemotherapy later. But there are many people who end up going into the AR-directed therapy camp, and it's it, people do sort themselves out pretty well in my clinic at least and they say you know I can't do chemotherapy right now because of my job because of the people that are depending on me for this or, or, or that um, because I just choose to live my life now and I want to avoid the side effects of chemotherapy and potentially take them later I don't want to lose my hair these are some of the things that I they think about and then when I try to dig into the AR targeted agents that's where it gets really hard Jorge and I think that's exactly why you drew me into this uh, question so we'll have to talk about it as a, a group too. I do think, and you mentioned before, that there is some fatigue associated with enzalutamide, though we do have a, a long length of experience with this drug, and so some people feel comfortable knowing that we at least have defined the side effects, and I feel like I've known them for a long time. Abiraterone comes with prednisone. Some people like that because maybe they have some bone pain, and that helps to resolve some of that discomfort relatively quickly, and they can get that and feel better, but other people don't want the prednisone. And then apalutamide, we know, does have its own side effects as well, rash and, and maybe some hypothyroidism and, of course, falls, things like that. But um, I think that people, in my clinic at least, sort into chemo versus AR targeted, and then we get into the weeds sometimes in those conversations about which AR targeted agent to choose. I mean, how do you have those conversations, Neil? So, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'm actually still pretty aggressive about um, the docetaxel six cycles, you know, up front. Um, the, the patients tend to be younger. I find, in my experience, I've been doing this now for several years, they tolerate it pretty well. Um, and they're younger, but they're, they've got probably better performance status. And why I started, I still am a little bit more partial to that is then if they have a really good response um, or good response, then before they become CRPC, the real question then is, okay, do I then add an AR-targeted therapy while they're still hormone sensitive to give them the best shot, which uh, we're in a data-free zone, right? I mean, we have some data we can talk about. So do I, uh, do, would I, prior to September, have added abiraterone and prednisone at some point in time once they've you know, gotten through their six cycles of docetaxel? And now you could also add um, apalutamide, that's been approved. Uh, and then enzalutamide, not yet approved, but probably certainly will be within the relatively near term. So that, I, I, I struggle with that. But, but I think you raised a, a great point, Neil. Perhaps if I can, either is maintenance after docetaxel, immediate maintenance before you wait for castration resistance, or triple therapy, which is ADT, docetaxel, and an AR inhibitor. You know, we have data, Arches included a subset of patients that actually had prior to docetaxel. Ensemet has almost, almost half of the patients who receive actually docetaxel, and Titan has what I think is 11% or so. So I, I think my only concern with that sort of triple approach or dosy followed by is then the data that we have appears to be good for PFS, for our PFS, but the survival data of all that sort of triple therapy or sequential therapy is still pretty immature. And I'm concerned because there are trials right now for high volume patients looking at specifically, which is the Arsens data, looking at triple therapy against high dose, against ADT and chemotherapy. And if in fact the data that we have appears to be negative or not positive for survival, that would put up a lot of pressure in that frontline space as to the timing of when you do one AR inhibitor uh, and when do you do chemo either immediately or, or together.